So Markus, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, I would like to uh, first uh, uh, start talking about how you started the company. So what many people don't know uh, is that you, you were 19 when you started Bolt. And Bolt is now uh, in the, the European area, uh, the number one player in mobility and overtaking uh, Uber and, and uh, other competitors. T tell me, why did you start uh, this, this enterprise? Why exactly in this space? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, overall, uh, I've been always into tech and into entrepreneurship as long as I can remember. So probably when I was about 10 years old, I got the first inspiration from Skype because uh, most of the founding engineers were in Estonia and my older brother was one of the early employees there. So from that, I really got the encouragement that you can actually build a global great tech company from anywhere. Um, even though Estonia had just you know, come out of Soviet Union just 12, 13 years prior to that. So, so that the, for young kid was a pretty big uh, change in perspective. And ever since then, I was looking at various different industries. And then by the time I was 19, I already had a bit of experience building various products. And um, that's the time when I decided that it's time to pursue something really seriously. Uh, so I was reaching, uh, actually researching uh, through various different spaces and realized that transportation is the one that has the biggest change coming over the next two decades. Uh, because it's very rare that you would have a space as large as transportation, which makes up between 15 to 20 percent of consumer spending in most countries around the world. And then you have everything happening from sharing, uh, micro mobility, autonomous vehicles, electric cars and so on. So just a, a massive, massive shift in the whole industry. So I knew that was the place to be if you wanted to make a big impact for the next two decades to come. That's a good point. Uh, you know, usually founders, they have... Uh... Uh, the reason to start a company when they feel a pain, uh, they want to solve something. Uh, so you're saying you didn't have any pain, you just wanted to go after this space because it's big and you felt like there are interesting opportunities in this space. Well, for me, I took a much more systematic approach uh, about it exactly. So I, I had a personal pain in, in a lot of different industries that uh, I could have gotten passionate about, but I wanted to take a more holistic view that I knew I was going to commit 10, 20, whatever, 30 years of my life into pursuing this. So I rather wanted to make sure it's the right market to get into as well. Yes. So let's let's start with, uh, with how you started a company. So th this is a very interesting holistic approach. Uh, yet to build something of, uh, of meaning and uh, have any impact, you need lots of funding. Uh, I know you told me earlier that uh, you spoke to many investors and uh, they just didn't bite. Uh, tell us why, uh, how did you pitch the company at the beginning and when did it start to change where uh, you started to have some interest from investors? Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, uh, we need to look back at the context as well. Uh, in 2013, especially in Europe and, and specifically in Estonia, there was a big limitation of how much capital was even available for uh, young founders, especially ones that were 19 years old and uh, didn't have a lot of network or connections or track record. So uh, that meant that uh, I had to prove first traction, just bootstrapping, raising no outside money at all. So I built the first initial prototype. Uh, just literally raising 5,000 euros from my parents and, and building that in Tallinn and getting it off the ground by talking to taxi drivers uh, by myself on the streets for months and months. Uh, then after we got to about 20,000 uh, MRR uh, in euros, uh, we raised the first angel round of about 100,000 euros. That was from a local angel investors who had mainly made their money from Skype 10 years earlier. Uh, and then after that, uh, we actually managed to raise a small round of about 1 million euros from uh, local European VCs. Uh, but the issue then was that Uber raised an unprecedented free 400 million euros in, back in 2014. Uh, and the issue was that absolutely most investors in Europe and in fact the world uh, were of the opinion that uh, once a company raises that much funding and they're so large, then that the industry is basically done. Uh, there is no point really to back anybody else in the space. It's going to be winner take all. Uh, and we were one of the few contrarians uh, who actually had a model and, and the confidence that this was not going to be the case. Uh, we were looking at the data, we were competing already with them in a few cities, and we saw that actually uh, this is a bit of a different space. Uh, transportation is hyper-local, uh, and just when you start to look at the, the network effects they have, it, it's not that strong that they would not support the second player who comes in and who's more efficient. Uh, but it took us four years 
to convince any investors that this was the case. So, so then we had to build a business with this tiny round of that we had raised about 1 million euros of funding. And we managed to build a company to about 100 million euros of annual GMV, uh, which meant more than 10 million euros of annual revenue. And uh, I think that's pretty unprecedented in terms of efficiency for a company uh, competing with, with any of the large well-funded companies in tech, especially one as aggressive as Uber. Uh, but after that, once we had that sort of traction, then already investors started to notice us and the perspective of the industry had changed. So it became significantly easier to raise funding after that. And, and by now, in the last three years, we've raised over 500 million of funding in total now. No, not only fully in the full scale, full scale mode, but uh, let's zoom into this uh, uh, strategy and tactics. What did you, what you, you did? Because uh, yes, Uber is a lot of money, and they they could go and spend that money in interesting ways. Uh, you, on the other hand, uh, had to find a way how to differentiate your company because there were uh, a bunch of companies uh, on the market uh, by this time. And what I really like is uh, the way how you focused on fixing the unit economics first and uh, 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 it's, it's really it's really super smart when when you uh, test the model for example in one city in uh, uh, in the capital of Estonia and you can see that you can beat them in uh, on a city by city basis even though they have uh, much more money they also end up with a much higher overhead you know and those uh, tens of thousands of people have to be paid from something but if you manage to be more profitable on the unit economic basis, then this is a very solid uh, way of uh, competing globally. Now, let's let's turn, turn the page slightly. And uh, uh, you say you wanna be uh, a holistic entrepreneur. So from the global perspective, Uber uh, had its biggest fight by then, uh, probably in China uh, with Didi. And uh, it didn't end well for Uber. So uh, they made some deal and uh, uh, what's interesting from the perspective of, of your company is that uh, you selected Didi as your strategic investor. Tell us why and how did you, uh, how did you do the ne- negotiations with them? Overall, uh, coming back to the fundraising, uh, even though we were by far more efficient in how we spent our funding uh, and we did manage to operate close to break even for many years, despite the heavy competition, we saw that there was so much potential in the space that we did want to raise external funding to grow faster. Uh, And as we had spent years and years talking to VCs in Europe who really didn't yet have confidence in the model, uh, it actually was uh, pretty obvious for us that, okay, who can we then go to? And we started to look at strategic investors in the space. Uh, one of those was OEMs. So we, we started to, for example, talk with, uh, with Daimler, one of the biggest manufacturers in Europe. Uh, and in parallel, we also got in touch with, uh, with ride-hailing companies in the space, uh, one of which was Didi. Uh, and because they had so much confidence seeing that they were able to beat Uber in China, uh, it made a lot of sense for them to bet and invest in many other companies in the space as well. So, so they actually made investments in all in India, in Lyft in the US and us in Europe and Africa. Uh, so they really ha- actually helped to bootstrap other competitors around the world as well. Uh, and they actually, uh, that investment strategy for them made a lot of sense uh, looking at it uh, now three years later. Okay. And uh, so now you had these uh, interesting partners to, to partner up with. And uh, now you also have, uh, have bigger ambitions. Uh, give us a snapshot of where is Bolt today and what are your upcoming ambitions in terms of expanding throughout the world? Sure. Uh, I think there's a few ways to look at this, one of which is on the, on the capital um, side and, and how we think about fundraising, which is that originally, uh, again, the space was so that most traditional investors and VCs didn't want to look at the space. They were thinking it's done. So we relied on strategic investors like Daimler and Didi, who really saw the potential and were willing to take more risk. Uh, But what has now changed in the last two years is that uh, investors are realizing there's still tremendous amount of growth ahead in the on-demand space. Whether it's with ride hailing, scooter sharing or food delivery, uh, we're now seeing that there's tremendous appetite to uh, to, to grow, uh, both in Europe and Africa. So that's why it's become significantly easier for us to partner with some of the leading investors in the world and grow the business significantly faster. That has been a big transition for us. Uh, And secondly, on the product side, as mentioned, we've now expanded from being the leading ride hailing company uh, from Europe and and operating in seven African countries to use that network to launch other services on top of it. So we've actually launched scooter sharing uh, now about three years ago 
we were the first retailing company to do that and actually have scooters in the same app. Uh, and next year, we're now going to be the largest scooter sharing operator in Europe as well. So we're, we're coming with more than 130,000 vehicles to European cities just this summer, and, and that's even growing next year. Yes. Uh, so, and what, what, on top of this user base, we're then now able to launch more and more services in the years to come. Okay, so when you talk about scooters, uh, you know, there was this time about three years ago, as, as you say, three, two and a half years ago, where lots of investors were investing in these uh, micro mobility solutions and, and companies. Uh, not many are still alive today. Uh, uh, why do you think there was suddenly this craze about investing in micro mobility? And why do you think the other players uh, did not uh, build a sustainable business for the long term? Which mistakes do you think they did? Sure, I think two reasons behind it. Uh, one is that overall, um, we are truly a customer obsessed company in the way that we operate. Uh, we, we haven't seen any companies in Europe or in the US for that matter, who would operate in tech with the frugality mindset that we have. Uh, I've seen a lot of companies claim that they're very customer obsessed, very cost efficient, but we've yet to see anybody to actually put it into practice to the level that we have. So when we then look at the space of on demand, whether it's in micro mobility, food delivery, or ride hailing, these are extremely capital intensive businesses. When we look at the past 10 years, in fact, these companies have probably raised more funding than in any other uh, tech industry. So truly being very cost effective here matters a lot. And why we do that is because having this cost efficiency culture and, and optimizing everywhere we can, we can pass on those savings to drivers mm -hmm. and to customers. So what it means is that we can, uh, in case of scooters, that allows us to just buy more scooters, have higher density, offer lower prices to customers, uh, and actually do all of that while retaining the same quality bar or even better than any of the other competitors in the space. So, so that's one that gives us a very unique advantage. The second one is that we are already operating now three or four different services in each of these cities. And we operate in 40 countries across 200 cities. So once you operate so many different uh, services, you have all the cost synergies there, which further give us savings and we can further pass those on to the customer. So it's, it's a, extremely difficult today to launch a standalone scooter sharing company in Europe and offer the attractive prices that we are able to offer to customers sustainably. And then when we look at it from a city's perspective, uh, it makes a lot of sense for the city as well, because they've been already working with us on the right hailing side for many years. They know we're a local trustworthy partner. So it's significantly easier for us to, to convince them that, uh, that we can also do an equivalently good job on the scooter sharing side. Yes. So uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, transportation is a, is a, is a very micro local uh, industry and uh, you have to be physically present in every single city, not just in the country, because uh, uh, it's so hard to launch these services. Uh, why is it so hard to uh, add drivers, for example, in a nearby city? And you have to, you have to launch from city to city. What, what makes uh, this so complicated? And uh, are you thinking of ways how you can uh, expand faster throughout countries? Absolutely. Um, so overall, uh, how we see it is that it's not per se difficult to, to operate this model, but it's extremely difficult to do it at the cost that would actually make sense um, and actually be lower than, uh, than the competitors in the space. So again, when we look at the, the different paths that we're coming from, then specifically US retailing companies, they started off with fares on, on average of $20, $25 per trip. And then also they had a 25% commission. So that meant on a per trip basis, they got $5, which is a lot. You can cover a lot of R&D and, and operations and so on within that budget. But for us, we started off in, in Eastern Europe where the average fare was maybe three or five euros. And we got the slight maybe 10% commission on that. So effectively there was an order of magnitude difference of how much was the income we were making on a per trip basis. So that really forced us to be as efficient in operating this model as, uh, as we could. And what that, uh, for example, uh, forced us to do was invest significantly earlier in automation, in technology, figuring out how do we standardize things so we can just scale the business a lot faster. And now six, seven years in, uh, we see all of those benefits are accruing. So we're able to operate right hailing at the, the most efficient level in the world um, in, in terms of costs and then pass all of those on to the customer. Uh, and we're doing the same on the scooter side and the food delivery side. So, so I think it just comes down to the tech investments and really the culture of the DNA of the company from day one. Yes. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's uh, very useful to know. Uh, now, let's talk about the pandemic because you know, the pandemic hit all industries, not just yours, uh, but it did uh, hit your industry 
maybe more than, than others because suddenly people are scared to travel and uh, uh, travel is affected. Yet uh, your industry proved to be extremely innovative, you know, and suddenly, you know, it, it literally took just uh, just few weeks where the, 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 the companies figured out a way how to, uh, you know, separate the, the space of the driver from the space of the of the person who is traveling and uh, on top of that you managed to grow the the uh, uh the revenue by by launching new product which is the the food delivery which is super smart uh, uh tell us how did you think about it and how did you prioritize whether to focus on fixing the, the broken transportation of people or moving in to this new product of food delivery well, uh, reality was that the very first thing we had to look at was that we were in a completely uncharted uh, territory. We, we had no idea what's going to happen. So, so overnight, in a matter of a couple of weeks, we saw uh, our revenue and number of trips drop by 80%, uh, which was massive. I mean, by now, we were, a we, we were a company of 1,700 people. So you know, we, we had to think, okay, how can we keep the whole team around? How can we keep on paying everybody's salaries and, yeah. uh, and come back from this? Uh, and thanks to the frugality and the cost efficiency we had, we actually made a pretty uh, unique decision, which was that we, were deci we decided we are not going to let go a single person because of COVID. So we actually were probably the only company mobility that did zero layoffs. And that actually gave people a lot of confidence that, okay, they don't need to worry about their job. They can actually focus on fixing problems. And then, as you said, we, we focused on three parallel tracks. So first of all, we did everything we could to keep our team and, and the drivers safe. So we started out uh, giving out hand sanitizers, blocking um, isolation in the cars to separate the passenger and the driver where possible. Um, we were actually giving free rides to medical workers, for example, and trying to partner with, uh, with companies to give donations to medical workers. So both the drivers could be making some income and we could also transport people to, uh, for example, tests and so on. Secondly, uh, we launched food delivery. So we were going from just three countries in the beginning of the year to operating food delivery in 17 countries today. So, so we just quadrupled that business and, and that fast, product yeah. overnight. Uh, and then lastly, on the scooter sharing side, we realized that that's probably the safest way for people to move around. Uh, so because you can do it, just you know, take it from the street and you can move completely alone without being in, in a busy bus or, or a subway. Uh, so we very quickly rolled that out to more than 45 European cities as well. So, so really all across these three parallel tracks we were able to operate thanks to keeping the team really focused and motivated and not worrying about whether they're going to have their job in two months. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, uh, that's a very useful, useful insight because, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, uh, it, it's very scary for companies when they suddenly, you know, they, they, uh, the, the money stops coming in. Uh, you have the payroll to, to do for the families. Uh, uh, to, to make sure people people can, can can get by, and suddenly this is a big issue. So uh, we felt a similar problem on, on the startup grind side because suddenly we couldn't do uh, our uh, our events and talks and conferences. We had to do it uh, virtually, and now we're talking uh, in a virtual way, which is in, in some ways even better because we can uh, anybody can join from anywhere in the world. Uh, but it's very scary, and uh, I also noticed that uh, uh, in different companies, different industries. Uh, many traditional industries just stayed scared and did move on to, to solutions. And uh, because your space is fairly new and uh, you had some, some tough fights be, behind you, you knew you can, you can solve it, this is great. Now, tell me, how do you prioritize uh, investing into uh, launching new markets versus launching new products in existing markets? Overall, it's a um, uh, framework we've been trying to standardize because it, it gets pretty complicated when you have 40 countries, 200 cities, at least yeah. three separate product lines. So everything we've, we've tried to do is boil it down to an ROI basis of, of looking at what is the incremental investment we're making into a specific country and, and how much value we generate for customers. And generally, we measure that by the number of orders uh, or by the uh, GMB on the platform, meaning like what's the overall gross bookings that, uh, that we're able to generate. Um, and having that methodology and trying to apply that universally on all the verticals makes it something at least close to an apples to apples comparison. And then in practice, what it means is that we're going to look in that, okay, uh, for example, are we going to launch right heading in this market? Uh, or we're then, for example, going to order more scooters and launch scooter sharing in a market. Uh, which, of course, has a lot of other variables as well. For example, regulation. There might be a case that 
Uh, we see that it's very tricky for us to get uh, a scooter license in the market because you know maybe it's only going to be issued in two years from now, uh, or in another case there might be synergy. So we see that we already are the leader in ride hailing in Poland. So for example, that's added value. It makes sense for us to launch scooters there because we can operate it at a lower cost than any other provider and customers, of course, will love the lower prices. So, so there's a number of factors that go into it, but it boils down to the ROI framework. Yes. Uh, a few months ago, you mentioned to me that uh, you try to run your company not as a, as a big corporation, but as a federation of startups. Uh, can you tell us what is the difference and uh, what are the signs that you, you, you're trying, trying to, uh, to keep it as flexible as possible? Uh, and what are the warning signs for you that, that uh, you're going into this dangerous te- te- territory of, uh, of uh, turning into a corporation as opposed to staying an innovative company? Well, um, overall, I see there's two way, two ends of the spectrum that we are trying to avoid. So on, on one end, uh, we would be completely decentralized so that all the decision-making power and, uh, and all the information is in silos and each of the 40 countries operates on their own, uh, which means that they are just making local optimizations and they are oftentimes reinventing the wheel. Or on the other end of the spectrum, we try to run everything centrally, uh, plan what each of these 40 countries is going to do and each of these products uh, is going to do. Uh, and we see neither of those work out. So we try to uh, do something in the middle of that, which is that uh, we try to set the direction in the context centrally, uh, but then the local teams are the ones that uh, need to do the, the planning and um, and then sort of bottom up, we, we create the plans of the company. So, so it's an iterative process between sort of setting the context, local teams coming up with the plans and then arriving at this globally optimized plan, uh, which is, uh, I've seen the best approach that enables us to maintain the speed and the freedom of the local teams, uh, but not sort of not creating massive chaos where every team is running in their own direction as well. Uh, and the reason I, I believe that's the best model is because really the, the quality of people is everything. And, and I'm a big believer in entrepreneurship and we really look at people who are basically running a local company so that every country we have, the local country manager has a very wide responsibility of what they do and ultimately they are responsible for everything that happens there. So we really need entrepreneurial type people, not, not just sort of specialists who only look at their own line and don't look at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, let's talk about hiring for, for, for a bit. Uh, how do you select, uh, select your people? Uh, and how, much, uh, how many people does the company have uh, in, in the headquarters in Estonia versus locally? And what is the trade-off you are trying to do? So overall, the company is now about 2,000 people, um, out of which about the third are in Estonia. And then the rest are distributed across the 40 countries we have. Uh, and the centrally, the, the team is, uh, again, responsible for setting the context, the bigger strategy, sort of how we think about various matters, and also collecting input from the country teams and spreading that to the other country teams. So we, we try to act as the central hub to connect country teams and sort of take the best practices from one country, transfer them to another. Uh, and this is something that, again, is, is hard to do in practice, but we see it's, it's the most optimal structure to have a good balance between this freedom and, and centralization and get the benefits from both sides. Now, benefits from both sides. Uh, do you see any benefits uh, when it comes to the pandemic in remote workers? Uh, where do you normally hire your, let's say, engineers, developers? Uh, because now, uh, if you think that you can really... Uh, run the company without having to travel so much and so on, then maybe you can also hire the, the, the people from, from elsewhere. What is your thinking on this? And uh, how do you hire your, your key people uh, if they cannot be uh, removing, relocating to Estonia, for example? Uh, are you hiring them from their home countries and work remotely? So overall, I uh, have a very strong opinion on this, which is that I don't think it's uh, more optimal for teams to be distributed rather than be in one physical location. Uh, yeah, so. but, but on the other hand, what we do have is that uh, different teams, of course, can be in different locations. So for example, when we have a specific product team, uh, let's say five to eight people working on a specific initiative, we, we see they are generally far more productive and happy when those team members are in the same city or the same country, at least so that they don't necessarily need to come to the office every day, uh, especially during COVID, they are working remotely, but we were allowing that previously as well, that they have flexibility, 
but there is value in them at least getting together a couple of times a month uh, to brainstorm, just build personal relations and so on. So I'm a big believer in, in that, that at least the team itself should be in the same location. But other teams that they collaborate with uh, less frequently, of course, those can be in different countries and, uh, and we've been always very flexible about that as well. Okay, so you wouldn't hire remote engineers, for example, from elsewhere if your key engineering team is in Estonia? Rather, what I mean is that uh, we're completely open to launch, for example, a new uh, location and, uh, and have the full team there. But what we generally don't want to have is the teams would be mixed so that a few people would be in one city and, and uh, half of the team would be in a completely different city. Yeah, and you sort of never, never get to meet in person. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, when it comes to innovation and, uh, and keeping, like you said, your holistic perspective uh, in the big picture, how much uh, in advance do you try to, to do you try to look uh, when you thinking about bolts? Uh, is it what's your perspective? Two years, four years? Uh, is it six months? Uh, uh, how, how big in advance do you try to see? Overall, we have a very ambitious 10, 20 year vision of how we expect urban transport in Europe and Africa is going to evolve. So very high level, how we see it is that there's more than a billion people. Uh, living in cities in Europe and Africa at the moment. And, and that number is growing rapidly by tens of millions every year. And we see that there's just not more room for cars in cities. Uh, we need to come up with something better than every individual needing to buy a car. And luckily, in the last 10 years, it has been finally viable that you can create a shared network of, uh, of smaller and lighter electric vehicles. So what we're trying to do is create a future where on demand, the person can get exactly the vehicle they need whether that would be a car uh, in terms of ride hailing, that could be a car rental service, that could be uh, renting an electric scooter or electric bike uh, or public transport for that matter. Uh, and, and create this future where not everybody needs to buy a car, you need to have a parking space, you need to sit in traffic and, and all of that. Uh, so, so that is a bigger goal where we want to get to. And we have a very simple way to measure progress, which is that we look at what's the percent of urban rides that are happening through these on-demand sharing platforms. And we've seen that we've been able to take that ratio from about 2% to 4 or 5% in the cities with the highest penetration at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but the goal for us is that we need to get it to 30, 50% uh, to displace most of private car ownership and then create this better future. Uh, so that's the bigger horizon where we're heading to, to actually move to a more sustainable uh, world of transportation. I understand. Uh, the reason I'm trying to, to ask you about your big picture is uh, I also want to see if you are backing it up with uh, this ambition with uh, concrete uh, investments. So when it comes to R&D and uh, to your innovation, are you investing in some initiatives? Uh, you know, for example, like your competition, competition is, is, uh, uh, has been talking, investing in, uh, in the self-driving car space, in the uh, vertical takeoff landing, landing space, uh, uh, the flying taxis. Uh, what is your uh, investment when, it's when it comes to, to innovation and the next generation of uh, technologies used by this space? We have a very high bar for thinking about where do we invest in. So we're absolutely willing to invest tens, hundreds of millions of euros into areas that we think over the next decade will have a massive impact. But we just don't think that vertical takeoff and landing sort of drones or autonomous cars are those areas. We think that the future is already here and the future is light electric vehicles. So that is one of the reasons why we actually see that as a core strategic R&D part of the company. So we actually have a full in-house team of hardware engineers. Uh, we design the industry leading scooters ourselves, which are the main reason why we're able to have them just last significantly longer and offer these great rides at, at a far more affordable price than anybody else because we own the hardware production in-house and the design in-house. So, so we're uh, doing that both on the scooter side and now looking at different other vehicles that, we're look, that we can uh, develop over the next years. So that for is, is one of the examples of areas that we really are very bullish on and very aggressively investing in. Rather than autonomous cars, which we don't really see are technically viable in the short term, the regulatory delays will be massive. So they're not really going to move the needle for us in the next 10 years. Yes. You know, one of the key topics uh, uh, right now for the planet is sustainability. Uh, how responsible is, is bold when it comes to resp responsibility in the uh, carbon footprint, in the uh, uh, running the, the company the best, the best you can? Uh, do you worry about uh, motivating drivers to use electric cars? Do you, do you motivate them uh, in some other ways financially or, or otherwise? 
what is your vision for uh, uh, keeping both uh, sustainable, uh, if, if at all? Absolutely. Uh, two points on that. First is that uh, actually th this has been something that's really core to our mission and, and how we think about it uh, ever since we founded the company, which is that the reason why we're doing this is again to transition to a more sustainable world of transportation. And that isn't everybody buying a private electric car. It, most of the problems are still there with private electric cars. Uh, what, what we want to move to is a shared network of mostly far, far smaller uh, vehicles like electric bikes and scooters. So we are really spearheading that whole transition in Europe. We're, we're the biggest operator of electric uh, scooters in Europe this year. Uh, and in the meantime, what we are doing is that we're offsetting all of the rides uh, from the cars on the platform so that we're investing hundreds of thousands of euros into various environmental projects in the meantime uh, to try to offset the emissions that are happening on the platform at the moment, which gives us another further financial reason and, and further incentive for us to make sure this uh, transition happens as quickly as possible. Uh, so we're really very, very bullish and increasingly taking action to uh, transition to the sustainable future as fast as possible. But we need to be realistic as well, which is that the main blocker at the moment for this transition is economics. Just electric cars at the moment are, are too expensive on a per kilometer basis compared to um, uh, internal combustion engine cars. And uh, luckily that is just at the moment starting to change. So, so we do see that drivers are increasingly buying electric vehicles across Europe and probably the picture will be very different in five years from now. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, uh, the hardware supplied for this industry, uh, could it be you know, electric cars or, or some hybrids or uh, you know, scooters or some other forms of vehicles? Do you see that uh, you wanna keep cooperating with third parties uh, and third party suppliers? Uh, or as you mentioned, you have some hardware engineers, uh, wouldn't it be easier and faster and cheaper in your case since you're very, very frugal to do it uh, in your own kitchen and design the, the vehicles which you think uh, could be the next generation? So overall, we've drawn the line that we are focusing our internal efforts on the light electric vehicles, meaning vehicles between maybe 10 to a few hundred kilograms in weight, uh, that are pretty small. Uh, and uh, on the car side, we, we partner with uh, new or existing larger OEMs uh, that already have far bigger manufacturing capabilities, uh, because the R&D requirements there are far higher as well. Uh, so, for example, again, Daimler is, is one of our investors already for the last three years, and there's many other OEMs we're looking to partner with as they bring these vehicles to market. Uh, when you talk about uh, these, these third-party suppliers, uh, uh, do you rely on the drivers to buy their own car? Or do you want to help them in some way? And uh, the, the, the key question I'm going to ask is, uh, uh, where do you see, uh, who is your ideal future driver? Is it somebody who, like now, you know, sometimes just has a job, but uh, they want to earn some more money, they just go and uh, spend some hours driving people around? Or do you, do, you, do you find that people should be professional drivers, they, therefore they would be much more customer friendly and they would much more uh, appreciate the, the opportunity and uh, you would have less th these recreational drivers? How do you see that? So uh, again, we try to approach that first from first principles from the customer point of view. Uh, and when we look at the demand curve, then what we see is that it's uh, not uh, flat at all. Uh, there's, there's a massive spike generally in the mornings, in the evenings, when, when people commute to the office, and we see this pattern even during COVID. Uh, and then, of course, on the, on the weekends, when people uh, want to take more rides and they're maybe not capable to, to drive themselves, or there might be that public transport is not available. So just we see it's not the constant level of demand. And therefore, we see that it's optimal for the supply to also match it. So, so we are actually seeing that it does not make sense to create a lot of artificial barriers to entry to basically force drivers to become full time, because uh, ultimately that means they will just be sitting idle uh, a lot of the time and, and then there will not be enough of them during the peaks. So rather what we are advocating for is that there should be reasonable uh, regulation that uh, sets the minimum safety standards uh, and, and actually technology is, is a great way to do it. And we're already having most of those features in place. Uh, and then actually just lower the barrier to entry, allow more people to offer this service uh, because ultimately that's uh, something that just makes sense looking at the industry demands and uh, that will result in lower fares for everybody uh, and actually people being able to take a ride exactly when they need one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh... 
looking at the industry, do you do you see? Uh, are you trying to look for inspiration when you when you look at uh, your competition, or uh, do you think the uh, the competition is uh, is in is moving and pushing some putting some pressure on on the entire industry, or this is more or less uh, independent islands of these companies? Because, for example, Lyft is just in the US. You know, uh, you operate in in a similar market with Uber, but you, you're more efficient. How do you see uh, the pressure to innovate from the competition versus uh, uh, from your own company? Uh, we always have a mix of, of both external factors uh, that we get the inspiration from, but at the end of the day, we need to serve our customers. So we've had a lot of examples where we just look at the competitors. It, it might be some of the biggest sort of companies in the space, and we're just wondering why are they doing that? So uh, as an example, we, we actually entered into most of our African markets um, in 2017, which was a year and two later after most of our competitors had already arrived there. Uh, but we were actually the first company to offer cash payments. Uh, so somehow, for example, they had just neglected that 97% of the population does not have a credit card uh, and they were just missing out on all of that market potential and not serving those people. Uh, while we were coming from a very sort of uh, just fundamental view of the market, we were looking at most people operating cash, why would we not offer it? Uh, so actually what we see is that in most, uh, most countries, we are the ones who are bringing these innovations to the market uh, even though we might be entering a year or two after, just because we have, we're looking at uh, this from a fresh perspective. And I think we're a bit more humble. We were much more open to localize the product to the specific market needs, not try to have just one uh, blanket global approach everywhere. Yeah, that's very, that's very useful. Marcus, we have some uh, some time for, uh, for all these questions. Uh, we already uh, covered this topic slightly, but... Uh, you know, since we have in our audience lots of startup founders and entrepreneurs who are running early stage companies, uh, I think it's really worth highlighting your stage of how uh, how hard it was for you to raise, uh, especially the seed round uh, when you were starting. And uh, uh, j just to highlight this, the, the fact that uh, what did you have to prove to the investors to make sure they understand that uh, your company is... Uh, uh, in, is investable. Uh, like, how hard was it for you to raise the seed round, and what did you have to show them to convince them? Well, uh, first, what, what we see is that, that there's more capital available uh, around the world for, for startups than ever before. The situation has actually changed a lot for the better in the last seven years. Uh, but ultimately, the main thing that, uh, that helps is having traction. Sure, if you have a great track record and you make a great pitch, all of that can help. Uh, but ultimately, the, the best thing you have is that if you have something that customers love and if you can really show that your customer numbers are going up, revenue is going up, uh, that, that's the biggest validation one can have. Yes, that's, that's a very good answer. Uh, before we finish, uh, you also uh, mentioned earlier something about uh, some interesting model, which I would like to know more about, which, which you mentioned, the franchise program. Uh, uh, is it uh, is it safe to to share with us what it is and why did you decide to build it? Absolutely. Um, so overall, our strategy from day one has been that Europe and Africa is our core. So so here we operate with our own teams, and uh, that applies to the retailing business quarters and so on. But outside, we, we see there is tremendous potential uh, to bring these uh, services to the market with a similar approach that we have of uh, making it just a lot more cost efficient for the passenger, making sure the drivers make more money or the restaurants make more money. Uh, and uh, what we've now launched a couple of months ago is a program to do that so that we are not expanding ourselves, but we are franchising, giving our technology to local entrepreneurs who want to launch these businesses. So, for example, in Mexico, we already have a, a first couple of partners who are operating in, in many cities, have a very successful business there, despite many large global players already in the same market, just because we've taught them our playbook, our technology, and, uh, and we're proving that these more local entrepreneurs can build a business, whether it's in Latin America or Asia or elsewhere. Interesting. They have to apply for it and be approved. And where do they go to, to, to see some more details about the program? Yes, they, they need to apply for a specific city or a smaller country. And, and uh, then we will review the application and, and give them a chance, uh, presuming everything works out. Uh, they can apply on the website. This is very useful. Marcus, I saw that you, uh, towards the, 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 the end of last year, uh, raised another round of funding. 
And your company is now rumored to be uh, valued at about $3 billion. Uh, uh, I don't know if you want to confirm or deny it or no comment uh, to, to that. So, uh, you know, you started this company when you, you were 19. You are now 26. Just uh, became 27 a few weeks ago. Okay, happy birthday. Uh, Mark, I think you did a tremendous job of building this company. Uh, uh, thank you for showing us that uh, you, can, you can beat a giant like Uber in your markets, you know, uh, on, on city by city basis and just keep improving, you know, stay, uh, stay humble. And uh, I, I really like the company. I'm, I'm using it myself. I, I use it twice today, uh, to, to be honest. I hope you're going to uh, keep your expansion and uh, bring us some, some news. And hopefully we can see you on the global stage of the Sarban conference uh, uh, in, in the following years. And uh, hopefully the audience, you enjoyed uh, talking to Markus. Markus, we're saying hi to Estonia. And uh, we're going to move on to the next speaker. Markus, thank you for thank coming you. today. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody.